is good to be with you folks this morning. And first of all, I guess I apologize somewhat for my accent. I'll try to put on an Aussie accent. Good day, mate. <laughs> As Pastor mentioned, yes, we were thrilled to get to know them a little bit better after meeting them a few weeks ago at a fellowship meeting. And uh, your church has been a blessing. Maybe you didn't realize it, but in a couple of ways. When we moved from America to Africa, we didn't take any furniture. And when we moved from Africa to Australia, we didn't bring any furniture. And so being invited by the Bramblets over to their house, one night he said, do you know of anybody that needs furniture? And here, dear gentleman in your church, uh, gave us some furniture that he was just getting rid of. So that was a blessing. So then when we went back, or came back over on this side to get the furniture, he said, do you know anybody that needs hymn books? And I said, well, we need hymn books. And so some older hymn books that you had that are basically new condition, they gave those to us. And the blessing about this, I didn't share this with Pastor, but in the back of the hymn books that you used to use, Living Hymns, there are some add-a-song pages. And we like to sing some of the psalms. And so I had a psalter, and I just copied out some of those psalters and already stuck those in, about eight or ten of them. And so we have those in the back of the songbook. We live out in Dalby. If you don't know where that is, it's an hour beyond Toowoomba, about three hours from here. We moved out there a little less than three weeks ago. Three weeks ago this Tuesday, we'll be there, and we have uh, met a lot of people out there. We didn't know anybody at all when we went there, and we met several folks uh, going door to door and distributing tracks and meeting our neighbors and things like that. And so if you know somebody out in Dolby or someone you'd like us to follow up on, maybe you can see me afterwards. I'll give you a little card here that gives my details, and we'll be happy to make a visit on them if if you feel that that would be in the Lord's will for you to give us their name. We'd appreciate that. Let's turn in our Bibles this morning to the book of Proverbs. Now, every preacher gets a little bit jittery when a, a speaker before him says, let's turn to Proverbs. And so in Sunday school, Brother Neville said, let's turn to Proverbs. And I thought, oh boy, uh, maybe he's going to steal my message. But he didn't. I want you to turn to Proverbs chapter 1 just to start with here this morning, Proverbs chapter 1. You know, the Old Testament has 39 books in it, and it begins with 19 historical books, and it ends with 19 prophetical books, and right in the middle are five poetical books sometimes called wisdom literature. Right in the middle of those five books in the heart of the Old Testament, so in the heart of the heart of the Old Testament, we find Proverbs. And Proverbs is full of wisdom. In Proverbs 1.1, 1, 1, it tells us who wrote the book. It says the Proverbs of Solomon. Now, he was the wisest man. And look at verse 2. It tells us why he wrote. To know wisdom. And so then the word wisdom or the word wise are found almost 120 times in this book. And if you look at chapter 4 of this book, Proverbs 4, verse number 7, the wise man says this. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. So it's like God is saying, in the heart of the hearts, here's the heart, and that's wisdom. Now, why? Well, let's go to chapter 9. Chapter 9. It said there in chapter 4, the wisdom is the principal thing. That's the main thing. So of someone has actually listed 49 character qualities. Of 49, or fewer, give or take a few, character qualities, wisdom is the main character quality to have. Now in chapter 9 verse 10, the scripture tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Chapter 8 and chapter 9 are parallel in some ways. And they, it, the chapters take wisdom and make it sound like it's a person. So we have a big word for that and we say it's personified. 
Now, in chapter 9, because that's where we're going to be here for just a little bit here. In chapter 9, you have a type of a structure in chapter 9 where the first part of the chapter and the last part of the chapter sound very much alike. And the reason why that's designed that way is to focus on the center part of the chapter. So in verses 7 down through verse 12, we have the heart of the heart of the heart of the heart here. Look at verse 7. It says, He that reproveth a scorner getteth to himself shame, and he that rebuketh a wicked man getteth himself a blot. Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. Give instruction to a wise man. He will be yet wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? Wisdom. And the knowledge of the holy is understanding, for by me thy days shall be multiplied, and the years of thy life shall be increased. If thou be wise, thou shalt be wise for thyself, but if thou scornest, thou alone shalt bear it. <laughs> so we've got the heart of the heart of the heart of the heart of the matter is wisdom. Now back up in chapter 9, verse number 1, I want you to note our main text. That's all introduction. Wisdom hath builded her house, she hath hewn out or carved her seven pillars. Seven pillars. Now I wonder, what's that mean? She's carved out seven pillars. Well, some houses that are just really stately have some pillars in front and they really aren't used for support, they're used for beauty. Our, one of the last places we stayed in South Africa was right next to a factory that made hollow pillars. And I was talking to the guy who made them, and I said, what are these for? He says, well, he said, out in the villages, the people like to impress people with the houses that they built. And he says, these pillars don't support anything. They just look like they support something. He said, they're there just as a facade, just to look nice. But they really don't do it. Now, I don't know if the pillars here were just for looks or if they really had some, some merit and some benefit. I think that now we, we, we're talking symbolism here because we've got wisdom that's personified. So those they're standing for something, but we're not sure exactly what they stand for. The number seven in the Bible is the number for completeness. And it would seem to me like what it's saying here is if you have wisdom in the heart of the heart of the heart, your heart, then your life, your house that's being built is going to have support. It's not just going to be for looks. Here we are in Queensland. I don't know about here in Brisbane, but out where we are, a number of houses are built up on pillars. When I visited Australia five years ago, I was up in the Cairns area, and, or whichever way that is. But, and I inquired, well, why is your house on stilts? And the fellow I was saying with said, because everybody else's house is on stilts. <laughs> Stomps, I guess they call them. A couple weeks ago, I met a man in Toowoomba, a young guy, 40 years of age. I said, what do you do? He says, I'm semi-retired. I said, you're semi-retired? You don't look like you're 40. Well, I'm 45, he said. I started a business. I developed a business on how to make stumps, and then I sold it, made it, made a profit. So he said, I could retire at the age of 45. Now, these stumps that hold these houses up, the type that he developed is a type of an adjustable stump so that evidently as the ground shifts, maybe due to the heat or extreme heat, you know, maybe to keep the house from going out of kilter, these stumps, you know, can be adjusted. But I gather that stumps or pillars here are not just for looks. Now, whether they're up to keep the water out of the house in case it does rain, or whether it's to get airflow underneath, or whether or not to keep the snakes out, or maybe to, those Queenslanders, maybe it's to keep the kangaroos out. I don't know. But I rather think that they're for support, and that Solomon says here, wisdom has hewn out her seven pillars. Seven pillars would represent 
the wisdom that we need to support us, and I'm going to give you seven areas this morning. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we ponder the scriptures and ponder some of these truths this morning, we trust that you'll be glorified and honored. We know that you are the God of wisdom. We look around us and we see not chance. We see wise design. And we know that that's because you're a wise God. We know the Bible is full of wisdom. We've just seen that if you want us to have anything, it is to have wisdom. I pray that we would have that wisdom. I pray we'd have the wisdom to be able to share these things here this morning that might be a help and a blessing to the folks here. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So consider, if you will, seven areas of life where I believe we need wisdom. And it's, it's noteworthy that in the Bible we find both men and women illustrating this type of wisdom I believe the Lord would have us have. So the first area of wisdom, I believe we need wisdom in our families. And I call this familial wisdom. You know, guys, you need wisdom in choosing a spouse. Gals, you need wisdom in saying yes. Parents, we need wisdom in guiding our children in that very most important avenue of life. We need wisdom in, in how to train our children in the way they should go. Wisdom is necessary in a family. You need wisdom, whether you're a parent bringing up children or you're a child submitting to the parents. We need that type of wisdom. What kind of wisdom is this? I call this the wisdom to pass on the faith. The wisdom to pass on the faith. Families are sadly crumbling. It shouldn't shock me. It still does shock me that as I meet people, I find broken, tragic homes. I am grateful for God's book when it comes to giving us wisdom on how to raise our children, how to have our family. You know, Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua 24, 15. I think of Lois and Eunice in the New Testament who brought up Timothy in the way that he should go. And the Bible tells us in chapter 3 and verse number 14 and 15 that from a child he had known the Holy Scriptures which were able to make him wise unto salvation. Examples of family type wisdom. I believe there's a second type of wisdom, and I call that wisdom we need in our church or ecclesiastical wisdom. You know, the church is God's institution that He has set up to accomplish His will of going into all the world and preaching the gospel to every creature. Churches need wisdom, churches are attacked by the enemy, and we need wisdom on how as a church to carry out the Great Commission, but I think of you as an individual. You know, you need wisdom on your part in the church here. Do you remember the thing that upset Jesus the most about going into the temple? And I realize this was, you know, not a New Testament church that he went into, but in the book of Matthew, chapter 21, verse 13, he got very upset when he said, my house shall be called a house of prayer, which you've made it a den of thieves. You know, if Fellowship Baptist Church is to be known for anything, it should be known that as a church that prays together. A church that prays together stays together. You probably have heard that. And I was happy to hear pastors say we have prayer meeting at 9 o'clock in the morning. It's good to start out your day with prayer. We need wisdom to pray. We need wisdom to pray. And yes, preach the gospel. And yes, to serve where God would have us to serve. But I think the apostles in the book of Acts... I mean, one of the first things you find, in fact, the first thing you find them doing, the very first thing you find them doing after Jesus ascended to heaven was praying. And the book of Acts mentions prayer a lot. Acts 1.14, verse 24, chapter 3, Peter and John went to pray at the hour of prayer. In chapter 4, verse 31, when, the, when they prayed, the place was shaken together. And you can just go right on through. I think that Lydia is a good example. Even before she was saved, she... Learned the importance of prayer. Acts chapter 16, when Paul got to Philippi, prayer was wont to be made. They went out to a riverside, and there they met some ladies. That's interesting. The church in Philippi got started with some ladies, you know, and their desire to pray. 
and Lydia gets saved and then probably became even more of a prayer warrior, so to speak. So there, there is that what we call ecclesiastical wisdom, wisdom necessary for you in your church. Then I would say thirdly, there is a third type of wisdom that we need in our lives if we're going to have those pillars of, of wisdom in our lives. And I would call that our relationship to the government or governmental wisdom. Sometimes we don't see a lot of wisdom in our governments. And it doesn't matter where, you know, I'm a citizen in one part of the world. I had permanent residency in Africa, and now I have permanent residency here. Probably not too many people have that. I can go and come from <laughs> different places at will, and I, I, I've seen probably a lot, at least I've read a lot, of different types of governments. And certainly our governments need wisdom and they need prayer. But let's bring this down to us in the room here. Do I need wisdom in how I relate to the government, especially if the government passes a law or tries to make a decision to placate a certain group of people? Do I need wisdom? I sure do. And I need that wisdom to purpose to do right. And I think the examples there, one is, uh, is Daniel. In Daniel chapter 1 and verse number 8, when the authorities over him wanted him to do something that was wrong, and the Bible says that Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. And God blessed that. I think of his three friends in Daniel chapter 3 and verse 16 when the government said, you bow or burn. And they said, well, okay, I guess we'll burn. And they didn't even burn, did they? But the female example of that is the wise woman of Abel Beth Sheehan, I think, over in 2 Samuel chapter 20 when Jehu was chasing uh, the enemy and he took refuge in the town and you'll remember the Bible says that the woman went to the people of the city in all her wisdom and of course she got the problem solved so we find examples in the Bible of people who had to relate to authorities over them and they had the wisdom that they needed it was one of those pillars that they needed so we need wisdom in our families we need wisdom uh, with our relationship to our church, we need wisdom with relationship to the government. And uh, fourthly, I want you to consider this. We need wisdom on our job, in our occupations. Uh, <coughs> I was talking to Nick, I think it was. Where's Nick? There's Nick in the back. And he was talking about how sometimes he has to work late so he can't come on Fridays uh, to youth activity or whatever because he's a young guy, he's not married, and so he has to work long hours. And the answer to that is, Nick, get married. <laughs> okay, real simple answer. <laughs> I know it costs money, and it means kids. Okay. By the way, we have 11 children. These are the last two. Um, so we know a little bit about those things. But uh, we need wisdom on the job. Wisdom when there are scheduling conflicts or wisdom when the boss says do this or do that and maybe the boss wants you to relocate but you relocate to a town where there isn't a good New Testament Baptist church. We need wisdom when, okay, do I say anything or don't I say anything? Do I, do I witness or, or on the job or at lunchtime or after? How do I do this? We, we need wisdom when it comes to this. And what kind of wisdom is that? Well, I believe we need the wisdom to please the wisdom to please our boss or honor our boss by being on time, by working hard, by having a good spirit. And what illustrations do we find of that in the Bible? Well, I believe we find Joseph in the Old Testament who worked hard, was diligent. In fact, he worked so hard that his boss just could let him have the free run and rule of the place because he could trust him. And well, it didn't matter whether he was in the palace or he was in the, the pit. He was a good hard worker. He was responsible, and God blessed that. Well, Joseph was given wisdom. He had that wisdom that he needed. I think the female illustration of having wisdom on the job is the virtuous woman. Proverbs chapter 31. And how she works willingly with her hands, and she feeds and clothes her family and things of like that and buys a field and sells it and things like this this sort of a thing 
So wisdom on the job. I think there's a fifth area where we need a pillar of support, and that is in the area of our finances. The area of our finances. Wisdom when it comes to budgeting. Wisdom when it comes to giving. We mentioned in Sunday school this morning, it was mentioned, you know, in giving to charity. And then <laughs> person taking the money and maybe doing something with it that they shouldn't do and how that makes you feel. And so then the next time you don't want to give at all. We need wisdom when it comes to, to giving. We need wisdom when it comes to investments. We need wisdom when it comes to buying and, and uh, you know, selling certain things. Uh, we have been trying to fill the gaps with some of our uh, furniture needs. And so I've been on Gumtree and Facebook Marketplace more, more of the last couple of weeks than I ever have in my entire life all put together. And, you know, a picture speaks a thousand words, but it doesn't always tell you the truth about this or that. So I wanted to get my wife a roll-top desk, but I couldn't spend a lot of money. Well, I found one, and then I asked them where it was. Well, they were in Ipswich. That's a long ways from Dalby. So I went down on Tuesday and was able to be with Brother Edwards at his church on Tuesday night. I went over and I got the desk, and uh, it wasn't raining in Ipswich when I put it on the trailer and started to take it home. However, when I got to Toowoomba and climbed up the Great Divide, there was a downpour of rain, and it rained all the way to Dalby. I was running out of fuel, and I was coasting basically back into Dalby. And when I got into Dalby, I found one fuel station that was open. I pulled in there, I put some fuel in just to get across town to get to my family's. And I uh, got in there, and the fellow said, this is 11.30 at night, he says, Hey, mate, what are you doing, washing your furniture? <laughs> that looked pretty foolish, didn't it? Well, when I got home, I thought i got to dry this stuff off, you know, so it doesn't shrink or warp or anything like this. So this, when I had picked up the desk, they said, we're really sorry, it doesn't lock. And they showed me a broken key. And they put it down, lifted it up. Well, don't you know. By the time I got home, after going two and a half hours, and with the rain and things like that, that thing had locked itself. And now I have a key that doesn't unlock it. I mean, when it comes to purchases and things like that, sometimes we need the wisdom of Solomon when it comes to our finances. We need that, and finances play a big role in our life. And so it doesn't hurt, like even at Christmas time, maybe you get a bonus or something like that. It does not hurt to say, oh, Lord, what would you have me to do with my bonus money? Uh, not just buying something on plastic and then not being able to pay for it later. So what kind of wisdom do we need? I believe we need the wisdom to prosper biblically. We need the wisdom to prosper biblically. Do we have illustrations of that in the Bible? I believe Solomon himself was very wise. God had given him wisdom. 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. Chapter 9, chapter 10. Uh, he was very, very wise steward. He had that wisdom that he needed so that he could uh, be an example. And, of course, he had to manage a lot. I, you know, the, Scripture tells us that all these tons of gold came from different parts of the world, people around him, uh, from Tarshish, from Ophir. Ophir is believed to be Africa, kind of in the area where we were. My wife and I were traveling through an area of Africa one time, and we got to a place where gold had been discovered on the top of the ground. They didn't even have to dig for it. So thousands of people moved into that area to get the gold that was just laying on the top of the ground and the first few people there got it all and they dug and dug and dug and didn't find any more gold anywhere in that area. Can you imagine all this gold coming into Solomon? He needed some wisdom on, and by the way, if you're not a wise steward of the small amounts, you think God's going to give you a larger amount to be a steward over? I don't think so. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much, the scriptures tell us. Jesus said that. So we need that wisdom. We have Solomon as an illustration of that. Um, we have the, the women who illustrate good wisdom and stewardship are the women who followed Christ. Remember some of them? The Bible says that he ministered to Christ of their substance. 
they ministered to Christ of their substance. Uh, they evidently knew how to get and to give because they had wisdom. I believe there's a sixth area where we need this wisdom, and that's in our friendships, or I call that relational wisdom. Wisdom to make a good friend. Wisdom to know when to break off a friendship. Wisdom when to stick with a friendship. Is this a good relationship? Is this a bad relationship? Am I having an influence on them for the good, or are they having an influence on me for the bad? Don't you think we need wisdom? One of the things in Africa that we discovered was that they are very much into friends and friendships. And we found that a friend could make them or break them. And I dare say that that could be true among a lot of us. So we need wisdom when it comes to having relationships. I call that wisdom to pick a friend or to perpetuate a friendship or to preserve the right friends. Now, who do we have as an illustration of that? Well, David and Jonathan, wonderful friends. In 1 Samuel chapter 18 and chapter 20, their relationship was such that it was not, as some perverts would like to say, a homosexual relationship when it says their love was passing that of women. It wasn't in a physical way. It was that they had a bond between them that they were willing to, to die for one another. And when Jonathan did die, David just mourned and mourned and mourned over the loss of Jonathan. That is an excellent relationship. Uh, but what about Ruth? Remember Ruth and the friendship that she had with her mother-in-law? Which... You know, I used to think it was strange that when a young couple got married, the dad of the groom would be the best man. I thought that's strange. And then the more I thought about it, the more I realized, no, really, in a boy's life, his dad ought to be, ought to have that, that close relationship. And wouldn't be a, isn't a bad thing to have dad be the best man. Well, Ruth's best friend was her mother-in-law. And she was willing to leave family and leave her idols and leave her country and go to a foreign place, to a language that she didn't know, to a people that she didn't know, to work in fields where she'd never been, all by faith. And she went because of her friendship with Naomi. So we have relational wisdom we need. And then lastly, I believe that we need wisdom with just the world around us. And I call that societal, societal wisdom. Uh, how do I live in the world but not let the world live in me? How do I walk in this world with only getting my feet dirty? You know, what do I get involved in? What don't I get involved in? You know, where do I go? Where don't I? Where do I shop? Where don't I shop? I'm trying to establish relationships with different people and in different ways. And so several weeks ago, I saw a really, really flat area and people standing out there with these balls and they were rolling these balls, called the Bowls Club. So the other day, I was out and about and I just saw some young people there, decided I would park my car and get out and go try to learn this game. What is the Bulls Club? You know? And so I was asking questions and watching how they rolled the jack and then rolled these balls and people were telling me a little bit about this and that. And I saw the clubhouse and so I went into the clubhouse, you know, looking around. What was I doing? I was trying, to, is this something I want to get involved in or not, you know? I, I, is, there, is it good? Is it bad? I don't know. <laughs> I remember one time a guy gave me, this is years ago, he gave me tickets to a horse race in Pennsylvania. He worked there. Thought I'd enjoy going to the horse race. And so I was excited because I grew up on a farm in Iowa. And, well, you know, okay, they get out there and they race horses. I didn't know that racing horses in Pennsylvania was affiliated with gambling. And a friend came through and I said, Jim, I said, I got these tickets. So he said, Jerry, you can't go to the horse races. Every, everything there is associated with gambling. Well, they didn't know. 
So we face things like this. We face, and we have, God, I need your wisdom. I need the, the wisdom, not just of Solomon. I need the wisdom of the Lord Jesus Christ when it comes. To, so wisdom has hewn out her seven pillars. And I, I believe that the illustration of a person who walked wise in his world and wasn't contaminated by the world was somebody like Enoch in the book of Genesis in chapter 5 or Noah in chapter 6. I think of the five wise virgins who took oil in their lamp. And the fact that there were other virgins around them that didn't have oil in the lamp didn't keep them from having oil in their lamp. So they had wisdom in society. So these seven areas, these seven pillars, familial, ecclesiastical, governmental, occupational, financial, relational, and societal wisdom. And I say, well, Jerry, where do I get that wisdom? Where do I get that wisdom? I believe that to get that wisdom that we need for life, that God says we need, that if we have it in our heart, it's going to be manifest throughout every area of our life, begins with salvation. I want you to turn in your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Know what it says about Jesus here. 1 Corinthians 1, verse number 30. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom salvation having a relationship with God through the person of Jesus Christ and what it says here in the Bible that's the starting place for me to get this kind of wisdom if your life is a disarray your life is a mess go back to square one go back to the starting point and ask yourself have I been saved and if you haven't been saved the Bible way then you need to grab somebody like pastor his wife or someone maybe that brought you and say what does it mean to be saved the Bible way. If I ask you the question, are you saved the Bible way? You know, if you're saved, you can answer that question the right way. And if you can't answer that question, or you don't know, you never heard that question, I'm not sure, it's time to talk to somebody. Because the Bible says now is the accepted time, now is the day of salvation. Having wisdom begins with salvation. Second of all, having this wisdom begins with determination. Back in the book of Proverbs again, and in chapter 2, the scripture says, My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understand, yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasure, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God, for the Lord giveth wisdom. That's chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. So there has to be that determination. For, do you really want it? Now, I would think a saved person would say, yeah, I need this. And you have a starting point. You, you have a, a head start because you have the Lord Jesus who is made unto us wisdom. And so if you have the Lord Jesus with you and, and, and his word, it comes through salvation. It comes through determination. Thirdly, that wisdom comes through meditation. Meditation. In the book of Joshua chapter 1, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous. Then thou shalt have good success. Meditating on the word of God. Christian, you need to meditate. That Old Testament Hebrew word is the idea of chewing. We have a lot of cows out there in Dolby area. Every year, over 200,000 cows are sold through the stockyards there in Dalby. There's cows all over the place. I grew up with cows. I used to milk some cows. My dad had cows, and those cows chew the cud. And they have like four stomachs in them. And they chew it and swallow it and put it into one stomach, then bring it up and chew it again, put it in the second stomach, and bring it up and chew it again, goes in the third stomach. And I mean, I don't know how many billions and billions and billions of years it took for that to evolve. Sounds like design to me. But the idea is to take the word of God and chew on it and chew on it some more. And it might just surprise you that a verse that you've read a hundred times still has life in it. So salvation, determination, meditation, supplication. James chapter 1, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that gives to all men liberally and upbraideth not. He doesn't chide you. He doesn't scold you. He doesn't say, I'll get out of here. Only thing you do with your prayers. 
Oh, if you need wisdom, you can supplicate. You can ask specifically for that and have that wisdom that you need, that pillar that you need. And lastly, look, if you will, at Proverbs chapter 10, verse 13. Proverbs 10, 13. How do we get wisdom? It's salvation, determination, meditation, supplication. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 13. In the lips of him that hath understanding, wisdom is found. Consultation. Asking others that are wise. If you've seen a person that lives a wise life, consult them. Ask them. Say, I need some counsel. Now, that's a humbling thing, but it's a wise thing to ask for wisdom from a wise person. So wisdom hath hewn out her seven pillars. You know, let's go back to the illustration of a house. What if one of those stumps under a Queensland house gives way? When we were looking at renting houses, we were looking at one out in miles, and it was way up high. You could put a car in underneath. I thought about putting my kids in underneath. I told my wife later, I said, I'm glad we didn't get the house because we have to haul the furniture up there. Now, our house is on just little short stumps. But what if you had a house and one of those stumps, one, gives way? Hmm. Well, I still got six to lean on. You going to move into a house if you know that six out of the seven stumps are good and one's bad? Mm. I don't think we would. Wisdom would say, no, I'll get that fixed before I move in. How about your Christian life? Is it built on seven pillars of wisdom? Well, you know, I have wisdom in this and this, but when it comes to finances, I'm not very wise. Well, time to get that wisdom. How about in your friendships? Ah, Brother Jerry, that's not a big deal. No, it is a big deal. The house is going down if one stump is weak or gives away. Your life is going down if you've got bad friends. It's time to implement and exercise wisdom. And maybe someone has said to you, maybe mom, dad, pastor, someone has said to you, that friend's not a good friend. Time to eliminate that friend. Maybe it's some other area of your life. Maybe in your family, dad, mom, you need wisdom with the children. Children, you need the wisdom to obey, honor, love your parents. Whatever it is, I challenge you this morning to get God's wisdom through salvation, determination, meditation, supplication, or consultation. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity we had to look in your word this morning. A lot of references, not a lot of looking. Wish we had the time. I hope that notes were taken. I hope people will study these things out and that this will be the wisest church here in this whole area because she is a church that knows how to go to you for wisdom. In Jesus' name we pray.